small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. It is without a doubt one of the most celebrated phrases in human history. A phrase uttered 50 years ago in July of 1969. Neil Armstrong arrived at the bottom of the lunar module ladder and a moment later man had walked on the moon. It was an incredible adventure that began eight years beforehand with a speech from the 35th President of the United States, John F. Kennedy. Why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Why then the moon? Well, a highly political choice. Right in the midst of the Cold War, as the Soviets were well ahead in the conquest of space. The Apollo program forced at lightning speed with a series of dramas, including the death of three crew members of Apollo 1, burned alive during a test operation without even having left the ground. An exorbitant cost as well, in today's money estimated at $237 billion but a brilliant political, scientific and historic victory. 600 million viewers, a fifth of the world's population at the time, watched Neil Armstrong's first step live on the television. It remains the lunar adventure that has ensured generations dream and continue to dream. NASA just launching the Artemis program to take American astronauts back to the moon by the year 2024. Well, our reporters have spoken to those who experienced the lunar adventure half a century ago and those preparing for the next step. Sylvain Russo and James Andre revisit the moon landings for France 24. I would have loved to have gone into space. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, I would do it today if they would let me. I think it would be one of the biggest thrills to ride that much power and then uh, have the experience of, of the weightlessness and all that. All the guys I know uh, that have been there said it's really something. And so yeah, I'd like to do it. Jerry Griffin is a legend at NASA. He was a flight director for all the Apollo missions. At 84, he still flies his Yellow Piper over Kerrville in Texas Hill Country an area where many former NASA employees have chosen to retire. Uh, Gene Cernan, last guy to walk on the moon, lived about five miles in that direction, okay? Jack Lausma, okay, astronaut on Skylab and, and shuttle, lives about one mile in that direction. Jerry Griffin, flight director, lives about 10 miles in that direction. So we all have decided this is the best place in the world to live. And with uh, surrounding like this, you couldn't argue with me. Tom Moser was a young NASA engineer in the Apollo days. Two weeks before Apollo 11 was to take off, his boss walked into the office with a top secret mission. The project is we're going to put a flag, a United States flag, on the moon. And he said, the reason you can't discuss it with anybody there's an international agreement that no country would claim the moon. Today, Jerry and Tom are meeting their old friend Jack Lausma, an ex-astronaut at Kerbal Airport. The three men are passionate about flight, and this airstrip is their usual hangout. Jack was shortlisted to walk on the moon with Apollo 20. The mission was cancelled, but he did fly a Saturn 1B rocket and spend 59 days in space on board Skylab in 1973. Then he moved on to the shuttle program. A big thump and it lights up. Boom, 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 boom. Yeah, yeah. Not like the shuttle rattles you all over like this, but it would go like that. But then, then you know you're on your way. But people think it's a big uh, boost when you take off and you're going like a scalded eagle in the, 
It doesn't. It lifts off more slowly, but the G forces build up with a maximum of four Gs. Yeah, that's pretty, only uh, pretty that's comfortable. Yeah, and um, uh, but it was a spectacular ride. And people ask me, would you, if you had it to do over again, would you rather ride the shuttle or the Saturn? I say, I'd rather ride the Saturn. It was a more exciting ride. <laughs> <laughs> it really was. That call that made that said we're in orbit. There was a. Uh, a big uh, relief, at least on my part. I thought the Saturn S1 stage and the S2 stage were, man, you were sitting on a lot of potential problem there if it ever got away from you, and it never did. And don't forget when, when Kennedy said put a man on the moon, we'd never put a person in space. There was a lot of things that we didn't know, a lot of systems that had to be developed, uh, in, both on board and on the ground for communications, command and control, navigation, so it was all uh, a, a huge set of challenges. I think we were too young to know we couldn't do it, so we did it. On 11, uh, that was a very clean mission. We didn't have many anomalies, and the most exciting part of that mission was probably at about 80 feet, somewhere thereabout. He just threw it in, he said, picking up some dust. <laughs> and when he said that, the hair stood up on it. It's still, since chills up my back because I thought, my God, we got humans in the spacecraft blowing dust. Uh, it was a great technological achievement. And I think we'll go down probably, uh, reflecting back now 50 years, probably the, the major achievement of the 20th century. Apollo inspired a whole generation. 50 years later, launches still fascinate the public. It was amazing. It was my first time watching it in real life, and just everything seemed so amazing. Watching everything and hearing everything, and the light that it shed on everything, it, I think it was amazing. Any, any move, movement forward in the space program is just going to make humanity better. Uh, experiments that they can do and uh, exploring the moon, Mars, whatever, let's do it. It's there, let's do it. Located in Florida, on the Atlantic coast, Kennedy Space Center is a sprawling complex regrouping 700 facilities. It was created in the 60s to launch the Apollo missions to the moon and is still the United States' main spaceport. It was designed to assemble, transport, and launch Saturn V, the biggest and most powerful rocket ever built. In the Apollo era, 20,000 people worked at KSC. Now, there are just 8,500. The Space Center is gearing up for a new challenge. President Trump has asked NASA to send a woman and a man to the moon by 2024. And today, NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine has come to brief the press on what is now known as Project Artemis. James Andre for France 24. Uh, well, no one set foot on the moon since 1972 for Apollo 17. Uh, my question is, why now and why nothing has happened between 1972 and 2024? Could I address that question? Is that all right? I, I just wanted an opportunity to, uh, to, to address, because it is an important question. The reason we're not at the moon right now after 50 years is because of the whimsical budgets that come from Washington, D.C. So the president said, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go faster. And the vice president, by direction of the president, announced that we're going to land on the surface of the moon in 2024 
What have we been doing for the last 50 years? Well, as Bob can tell you, as somebody who is um, part of the team that helped assemble the International Space Station and those kind of things, we've actually been very busy for the last 50 years learning how to live and work off the surface of the planet for a long time. And because of that, we actually have opportunities to now apply what we've learned on the International Space Station to the moon for a sustainable lunar return. I have heard people say, well, you know, you know, China just landed on the far side of the moon. Um, how did we fall so far behind? I also want to be clear on this point as well. We also have landed on the far side of Mars, and we've done it eight times in human history. That's a pretty difficult thing to, to do. The United States of America is the only country that's been able to do it. Thank you, though. This time, NASA wants to return to the moon to stay. The project is to install the Gateway, a space station in lunar orbit, that will be used as a waypoint to the surface of the moon and potentially to Mars in the future. To build Gateway and return to the moon in just five years, NASA needs an estimated $30 billion. To keep the cost down, the agency wants to rely on help from its international partners and use the private sector to deliver equipment to the moon. Intuitive Machines has won the first $77 million contract. The company is based in Houston, Texas. This is, this is the main engine. Everything here is made in-house. So uh, we 3D printed the, most of the engine parts, and all of the assembly, all of the design is completely done here. All the systems this small 86-employee company has developed the Nova Sea Lander, a fully automated spacecraft capable of delivering a 100-kilogram payload anywhere on the lunar surface. So over the last 50 years, we have developed a space industry. And through telecommunications and uh, weather satellites, the component technologies you need to build spacecraft now exist separate from a single mission and a single purpose. So you have some supply chain. Most of the challenge for, say, a lunar lander like this is not inventing new technologies it's integrating the technology we already have in a way where you can afford to do business. Intuitive Machines is set to become the first private company to land a spacecraft on the moon. This is the domain and the purview of superpowers, Russia, China, the United States. And here a small business in the United States can aspire to win a contract, win a mission to the moon, and land on the moon. Where else? What a great time in history. If you build a spacecraft to land on the moon, it's an achievement that, that it'll, it'll be with you and, and echo through your family for generations. So we're very excited about it. Could you imagine being able to tell your grandchildren when they look at the moon, some of that light comes off something I built? Nova C is due to land on the moon by July 2021. NASA is returning astronauts to the lunar surface, but the ultimate goal is Mars. In 2009, an Indian probe discovered vast amounts of ice at the moon's south pole, raising the possibility of producing hydrogen and oxygen, essentially rocket fuel, to go further. The moon is merely a training ground and a potential fueling station. Today, nations across the globe want a piece of the action. This remote part of the Utah desert resembles the surface of the red planet. It's home to the Mars Desert Research Station. Every year, students from around the world meet here to take part in the University Rover Challenge. 34 teams have come with their homemade prototypes to face a series of tests. It is both electronics, mechanics, autonomy, but also management, working with people. There are many issues with that, and we still learn. It changes your way of seeing things. You discover other cultures, you gain experience and ideas you wouldn't have had if you hadn't taken part in this challenge. That's great learning experiences. It's even better than the university itself. It gives us uh, practical knowledge and skills. and. We believe it's great preparation for future work. We've had students end up working on technology that ends up on the Mars rovers. 
We've had startups forming in Poland from the experience the teams over there have learned. It, it's, it's amazing where the students have ended up from, from this experience. The tests are designed to resemble real-world tasks rovers carry out on Mars. Okay, if you guys are out there and you press the red button, task it over. Team Rudra has traveled from Bangalore. India is one of the rare countries to have a comprehensive space program. It hopes to send a rover to the moon before the end of 2019 at a fraction of what it would cost NASA. The rover was made very cheap and uh, every, uh, economically. So yeah, this is the cheapest rover on this field right now. <laughs> how, how much did it cost to build? It was $800, around $800 to $1,000. Yeah. In this test, the rover is remote controlled. The pilots cannot see it, and there is no communication between the team on the ground and the control room. The rover must navigate rough terrain, find, pick up and drop objects, like this hammer, at specific locations. They're cleared for stage two. They get 20 more minutes to complete stage two. Only a few teams made it to stage two. Still, in the end, the terrain was too rough for the Indian rover. Oh, oh, go. Go on, go. At this very station, we've demonstrated uh, the profound superiority of human explorers over robotic explorers. They can do what is necessary for fossil hunting, like hiking long distances through unimproved terrain, doing heavy work like pickaxe work, and doing delicate work like carefully splitting open shales to reveal the fossils. Mars was once a warm and wet planet. It was actually very similar to the Earth. If life appears wherever it has a decent planet, it means life's everywhere. When Armstrong walked on the moon 50 years ago, the United States took a step towards victory in the Cold War. Space is still regarded as a superpower status symbol, and the Americans want to stay in front. A new space race is on, and this time for the Artemis generation, the finish line is on Mars. Sylvain Rousseau and James Andre revisiting the moon landings for France 24. That's all from this week's edition. More editions coming up, of course. You can catch them again as well on our website at france24.com. The latest news very shortly. Stay with us.